Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning on a sunny Sunday morning. Again, it's been a couple weeks since we've seen many of you. Uh, It's so good to see uh, all your smiling faces this morning. Thanks for joining us for worship. A special welcome to visitors and guests. Glad that you're joining us this morning and hope and pray that this morning's worship for you is meaningful to you through God's word, through the music, and through fellowship with one another. On page 20 of your pew Bible is the first reading, comes from Genesis 15, verses 1 to 12 and 17 to 18. God's covenant with Abram. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. On page 1829 is the second reading. Philippians 3. Chapter, or, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 to chapter 4, verse 1. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For, as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. The word of the Lord. This morning's gospel reading comes to us from Luke chapter 13. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. And he replied, Go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you, to you desolate. 
I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And please be seated. I know this to be true, that there are more than just a couple of us here in this space today who ex have experienced being truly desperate, being on the verge, on edge of a complete and utter meltdown in life. On the brink of our lives, seeming like they are going to collapse, walking as if we're going through this doorway into hell. And I would have guessed that many more of us have come close, or at least it feels like, it has felt like, as if we've come close. Now, if you identify with this experience as, as someone who has come face to face with the abyss, then you know full well that there's nothing, sometimes nothing more annoying nor less helpful than those well-meaning words we hear from other people in those times that say, don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. Just relax. Let go and let God, or it's all part of God's plan, this pain. I mean, those words can come from people who are well-meaning and have good intentions, but at the moment of great loss and heartache in our lives, they're really not that helpful. And I know that they're trying to be helpful, and I appreciate it. However, many of us who know, how many of us know of a single situation when those words have been spoken, and then our response afterwards is, you know, I, I never thought of that. I, this is a little sarcastic. I know I never thought of that. You're, you're pr absolutely right. I, I guess I really shouldn't worry or, well, now that you say it, fear does seem like an irrational response. Now, I for one can't think of a single time in my life when this has been the case. And those comments at times seem to minimize the fear and pain that resides in people in those situations and those moments of life. Those comments might be more about the person speaking them and their need for a tidy response to a painful situation more than anything else. Our role in those times may just be to stand alongside them in their pain and in their fear and say, I'm sorry for your loss. I'll be with you in this difficult time. I won't leave you alone. Fear. Fear is such a powerful force in our lives and in our culture, isn't it? So much in our lives and in our society and in our world is motivated by fear. We have a lot to fear, don't we? We fear. Sometimes we fear finishing last. We fear going broke. We fear losing it all. We fear being alone. We fear not fulfilling our own expectations or sometimes even worse, the fear of, of not meeting the expectations of others have on us. We fear the spot on our back that seems to be growing. We fear that the new kid on the block. We fear the people who are different than us. We fear the headache that we're experiencing and we're convinced that somehow it's more than just a headache. Fear is that bully in the school hallway, brash, loud, and oftentimes scary. Fear drives us into a prison of our own thoughts and feelings and slams the door on our face. And we feel like we're locked inside and there's no way out. My friends, as part of our faith in our God is that God is at work in those times. And intercedes and intends to free us from that prison. 
the prison of our fears. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Abram is at a critical point in his life and especially in his relationship with God. At the beginning of Genesis chapter 15, we read Abram had, is in his tent late one night, and he's a very old man, and his wife Sarah is getting up there as well, and the two of them, they are experiencing not having their own child, and they are fearful, they are disheartened, and in the ancient world that they lived, nothing was more disheartening than this, not having someone to pass to carry the family name. And at this point in the story, Abraham and Sarah have been trekking across the desert for decades, trusting in the promise that God had made with them years before, a long time before. And after all this time, there was still no evidence that the promise of God made to him and Sarah would be kept. And to stay hopeful at this late stage of, of their lives would seem rather foolish don't you think? I mean, Abram is probably about 80 years old at this point in time in his life. And of course, as we know, Sarah will give, give birth to Isaac later on in the Genesis story when she's about 90 years old and Abram's about 99 or 100. That's a lot of patience. But let's not get ahead of ourselves in the, this story because the story that we read to today, Abram's not really all that patient at this point in our reading. At this point in the story, he's, he's actually losing it. He's, he's lost his you-know-what because the night Abram complains, that night Abram cl- complains to God and he, let, he lets God have it. Essentially, he tells God, you've given me nothing. I left, you, I left everything for you and you promised that if I left everything for you, you'd give me a son. I've reached my limit, God. I can't keep putting Sarah through this and I can't go on either. And you can imagine the anxiousness, the anxiety, and the fear in his voice. You can just feel the, the heaviness and the sense of betrayal that Abram was experiencing. And just like God does over and over again, even in our lives, God isn't offended at Abram's words. And instead, he leads him out of the tent into the pitch black night. And he says, Abram, look up. Look up. You think that your journey is over. You think that your life is over and that you've been wrong in trusting me. But I'm telling you, your ancestors will be too many to count. Just as the stars in the sky are too many to count, you won't be able to count all of your ancestors. So, Abram, be patient. Trust me. This story, this story is an expression of the the deep commitment that God makes with humankind. It's a deep commitment that is later repeated in the story of Jesus' own life and death and resurrection, the incarnation. It's the story of God's unwavering promise to be with us always, to be present to us even in the darkest, most scary moments of our lives when we feel abandoned, when we feel betrayed, when we feel like we've been forgotten, when we feel like we are standing at the doorway of our own hell. The story reminds us of the promise A promise that in the moments when we feel most vulnerable in our lives and when we feel the most alone, like Abraham, that God will not abandon us. That God promises to love us and never let us go. It's the same promise that is made to us at our baptism with that cross of Christ on our forehead that God keeps love, God's love keeps coming after us throughout our lives even in the times of great fear that can seem too overwhelming. I don't know about you, but I've been really taken or shaken and also kind of feel a little bit off 
the last couple of days in light of the shooting in New Zealand. And it's like it's something heavy is sitting inside of my gut and it's overwhelming to carry. We live in what seems to me a very hateful time where fear seems to be winning over love. And in times like this, I have a, a, a deep sense inside of, of me, a feeling of, of being at loss for what we as a world should be doing. And I, I ultimately have no idea if the world can ever be changed. At least that's what I'm feeling. And if I'm honest, I don't know if it ever will get better. Well, it's on my bad days. And I wonder sometimes, I'm, I'm at a loss thinking, I don't know if anything we do is going to really make a difference in light of all the seemingly mountain-sized things we have working against us as a humanity. Everything from nationalism to white supremacy to consumerism to militarization to xenophobia, just to name a few. But then I hear those words from Jesus in the gospel reading from today. And he was weeping over the city that he loved, Jerusalem, and that it was going to change, and that it wasn't going to change from the path of self-destruction of hate and violence that it was on. And Jesus cries out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood of chicks under her wings and you were not willing. A mentor of mine, Jonathan Martin, said about all of this, Jesus was under no delusions. This was not going to end well for Jesus or them for Jerusalem. It has not for any prophet. Jesus held out hope for Jerusalem, but only the kind that might come on the far side of dying on the other side of a violent and hateful path that they were on. Can small acts of kindness change the world? Can prophetic tenderness withstand the rage of the beast or the more sinister dragon indifference? Can a song, a poem, a sermon, a hug, a march, a community, make sound long, loud enough to be heard over the roaring wind? I don't know. I only know what love does and what love must do. That love is the only thing to stand for no matter what happens to us. The love stands in between the accused and the accuser, the victim and the shooter, the world that is and the world that is yet to come. Love stands vulnerable. Love stands defenseless, not because it works, but because there is no other choice. Barbara Brown Taylor writes of this text from Luke saying, Jesus won't be the king of the jungle in this or any other story. What Jesus will be is a mother hen who stands between the chicks and those who mean to do them harm. She has no fangs, no claws, no rippling muscles. All she has is her willingness to shield her babies from, with her own body. And if the fox wants them, he will have to kill her first which the fox does as it turns out. He slides up on her one night in the yard while all the babies are asleep, and when her cry, when her cry awakens them, they scatter. And she dies the next day where both foxes and chickens can see her, wings spread out, breast exposed without a single chick beneath her feathers, and it breaks her heart, but it does not change a thing. She goes on to say, if you mean what you say that love can overcome in your faith, then this is how you stand.
like those of my ELCA colleagues and our ELCA friends, Lutheran friends and other ecumenical partners who stood outside a mosque in Wilmer on Friday afternoon. I wasn't able to be there, but they stood outside the mosque and prayed with our Muslim brothers and sisters after their Friday afternoon prayer time and it was a way of supporting them, of standing in solidarity with them in this time and just like them, I know that I want inside of myself to find the strength to stand in light of a deep fear for our communities, our nation, and our world. And really, what else could I do? In times of fear, this is where we as Christians stand. The cross we journey on towards with towards. Uh, towards Good Friday with Jesus this Lent is one that may not protect us from things that would harm us, but it is one that shows us what love looks like in the midst of fear. Love. Love looks like standing alongside our neighbors who are experiencing fear and uncertainty. Love looks like speaking up and saying no when people speak hateful and harmful, harmful words towards others. Love looks like sitting with someone at the lunch table at school with that someone who nobody else talks to. Love looks like telling someone who is experiencing pain and loss that you will walk with them on their journey. Love looks like smiling and saying hello to someone who doesn't usually get the time of day from most other people. Love may make us uncomfortable. Love may get us in good trouble with other people. And love certainly may not make us popular. But love is our only choice. All of our readings today involve overcoming fears and anxieties through this profound trust in God. This trust is not a false hope that nothing bad or difficult or frightening will ever happen to us, but it is a hope that is rooted in the trust that God's love can and will overcome. People of God, the good news in this is that we are grounded in a love so deep and so profound that even when it does look like there, is, there isn't any hope, we know in the deepest part of our souls, in the deepest part of our guts, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Period. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.